welcome to Brick Cats. My channel is for anyone who enjoys custom LEGO creations, like saving money, or those looking to get into custom building. If you're a fan of my channel or are interested in supporting what I do, please consider subscribing, liking this video, or leaving a comment. Each subscription, like, and comment helps others find my channel, and I greatly appreciate it. Today, I am finally reviewing what Brick Vault calls the UCCS Slave 1, the UCCS standing for Ultimate Custom Collector Series. With big models like this, I typically spread collecting the parts over a longer period of time than smaller models to save on costs, and that's why it's taken me over a year to build this behemoth of a model. If you're interested in building this or any other Brick Vault model, you can take 15% off the cost of your order by using my discount code, CATS15. I do receive a small amount of compensation when you use my code, and this is an amazing way to support my channel while taking a bite out of the price of the instructions. Without any substitutions and buying only from BrickLink, I was getting 9 stores and $1,001 without shipping and tax for the ship and stand, or about $1,152 with shipping and tax, and for the purposes of calculation, I did use $9 as a shipping and handling average, just because the quantity of parts you're buying tends to be quite large. In my reviews, I offer my opinions on aesthetics and model features, parts issues you might want to look out for, the build experience, the model's integrity, and I close out with my overall impression and pricing information in the conclusion. If you're watching this review, I assume you have bought the instructions or are interested in buying them. I also assume a basic level of familiarity with BrickLink's ordering system and LEGO nomenclature. I only use genuine LEGO bricks and I always purchase the instructions. Finally, I create these reviews for my own personal enjoyment and in the hopes that my advice will make your experience more enjoyable and or less expensive. The UCCS Slave 1 measures 21 inches tall, 16 inches wide, and about 8 inches deep. The display stand's base is approximately 7.5 inches square, so that's the minimum amount of table space you'll need to hold this securely. This model contains a mind-boggling level of detail, and you can spend much more time than I have here staring at this thing from pretty much any angle and see something interesting. I'm going to start here at the bottom of the nose section, and this might be my favorite part of the model just because the angles work out so well here. The sides of the nose are sloped towards the camera here, but the use of the camera piece and the cannon makes the cannons parallel to one another. I will point out that there is a black candle piece used down here. This does come in dark bluish gray, but when this model came out it wasn't available in dark bluish gray. The proton torpedo launchers are also located towards the bottom of the nose, right where this section is right here, but there's no space to build this in, and this is a very understandable omission. Moving on up, there's some piping along the side leading down to the cannon, and you can see the incredible shaping the designers have accomplished for these angled slope sections right on the front, and the sloped assemblies to either side to create a nice smooth exterior. About midway off the fuselage behind this little hatch is some sort of missile launcher. I wasn't exactly clear on what this is supposed to represent. The Incredible Cross-Sections book says there's supposed to be a hidden ion cannon here, and it doesn't look very cannon-like to me. Um, it looks kind of more like missiles of some kind. But I could just be missing something, or perhaps there is a different reference the designers were using. It still looks great, and it's relatively easy to pop in and out. Another thing I really love about this model, and appreciate in general, is that the two sides of the ship are asymmetric in their detailing. This makes for a more interesting build and just looks better for a ship that has been through some rough patches. So I will slowly turn this around, and you can see that the opposite side, opposite side does not have a hatch with weaponry, uh, but there's like a cupboard piece here, um, some grill tiles, and some other dark bluish gray detailing where that is not on the other side. The large green round bricks to either side of the cockpit are the same used on the official UCS set to create the circular sections around the rotating wings, although this implement in this implementation the section is slightly larger with this arch brick in the middle here. The cockpit itself uses the Slave 1 windscreen if you have it or can get it for a reasonable price, good luck! There are also instructions on how to spray paint the trans purple version of the windscreen, which is much cheaper, and I honestly really like the all black solution. I didn't put it on, but I did buy one just to try it out, and it works pretty well. If you can see here, I did have a little bit of difficulty getting the paint to stick right around the um, top connection point here. Uh, a little difficult to see, but you can kind of maybe get a little hint of trans purple there. Uh, but the good news is that it's not really visible, um, and spray painting the inside only um, tends to give you the best results. There are also instructions for a brick-built solution, which, while I appreciate the inclusion, I don't think it looks very good. 
So I definitely recommend the spray painted windscreen if you don't have the UCS version to spare. Inside the cockpit, there's only room for the pilot. It's simply not possible to squeeze in a co-pilot's chair next to it, unfortunately. There is some nice detailing around the cockpit's or the pilot's seat as well. And the passenger compartment is similarly space limited. It's a little difficult to see, but there are two black seats down there. But while these seats are in the cabin accurate location, you can't fit more than one figure at a time because the seats are right next to each other. So the arms uh, of the minifigures kind of preclude you from fitting more than one in there at a time. The cockpit assembly does roll with the ship via a simple gear mechanism, and there is a good amount of resistance in that motion such that it's not flopping around. The top of the ship above the cockpit in the flight orientation is very nicely rounded off. More on this section later, and my build isn't as nice as it could be, but you get the general idea here, and this is a very, well, supposed to be a very smooth shape. The wings are very detailed as well. I think tan definitely looks better than the mix of light bluish gray and yellow on the UCS model, but again, depending on which source material you go with, light bluish gray is probably an option. Dark tan would also fit, but I assume you run into inventory issues there as dark tan is not as popular a color. In any case, the shape of the wing is spot on, and the flat section is accurately rendered on the trailing edge back here. Using the minifigure wand and the yellow clips for these little three ridges is a great touch, and the shape of the support struts is also pretty much perfect, with the newer timing gear extensions in the center here, and the dark tan sections that you can barely see poking out right here, where the struts connect to the main hull. The engine housing from the front is extremely well done, with a series of interlocking sub-assemblies that use panels overlapping with their neighbors to create a smooth effect. The entire thing is surrounded by slopes clipped to long flex tubes, and the curves are subtle enough that the gaps between the slopes are minimal. There are a few areas that don't match up quite as well as I'm sure the designers wanted or intended them to, and some of the sections you see online are simply due to my build being a little finicky. But overall, the effect is extremely impressive, and it looks very slick. So here you can see that I think this might supposed to be... or this should probably be more flush, but um, again, I'll talk about this more in the build experience, but once you put these in place, you don't really want to move them. Um, so there's just a little bit of a gap there. And there are some other spots where this is the case as well. Turning this around to the starboard side, I really like the weathering effect of using these 1x2 wedges on the bottom here. Underneath the nose, the loading ramp door can be opened and closed. This is where the stand holds the ship in place, so the underside of the nose has some play to it to allow the stand's column to fit nicely. The backside of the Slave 1 includes a sonic charge bay with a very well constructed, if slightly oversized in my opinion, sonic charge. Apparently, it was also somewhat difficult to get out. And if the front of the ship is not impressive enough for you, in my opinion, the back is where this really shines. Noteworthy, of course, are the three engines, as well as the high-power rectenna towards the top here, complete with, detailing, with details representing what the cross-section calls the magnetic tuning antenna to either side. And as you can see, the backside here has just a ridiculous amount of detail, and I have a lot of fun searching for some of these details from the in-universe shots we get of the ship, as well as reference material I can find online. Say what you want about the Book of Boba Fett, but it was good for at least one thing, and that was glamour shots of the Slave 1. I also found some pictures of the back of the film models, so here are a couple of comparisons that highlight how committed the, desi the designers were to getting the smallest features correct in the final product. I also appreciate that the detailing isn't just on the surface. There's a lot of depth that is easier to see in person, of course, but it's not as if the model was constructed and then all these details were added to the surface at the end. The display stand is included in the instruction set, and you should not leave it out in my opinion. It's all black with a very strong Technic column that fits snugly into the loading ramp. There's a little stand for the minifigures to uh, well, stand on. And I modified mine to just have one set of studs, and the all-black base of rounded edges looks very good to me. To sum it up, I think the UTCS Slave 1 is the most visually impressive model I've built to date. 
It's clear that the designers were meticulous in trying to recreate even the smallest details, and the way they were able to build some of the complex shapes of the Slave One with hardly any illegal connections and reasonably available elements is incredibly impressive. The UCCS Slave 1 requires a whopping 693 elements and 4,677 pieces, while the stand requires an additional 48 elements and 370 pieces. The two-wheel 43.2mm diameter by 18mm flush axle stem in light bluish gray, part 86652, is typically quite expensive at over $6 each in the United States. The mold variant, the wheel 43.2mm diameter by 18mm extended axle stem, part 32020, tends to be much less expensive. This wheel works with one minor caveat. Since it doesn't have an axle hole, the bar doesn't go straight through the wheel, and thus doesn't line up perfectly with the two round plates behind it, which connect it to the model. I'm sure this is an illegal connection as a result, but it doesn't look any different, and bar pieces are inexpensive to replace if it gets damaged. So I've got one of each on mine to show you the difference, or the lack thereof. So you can kind of see the difference here. This is the extended stem, and you can see that this bar, it's not an axle hole, so it just goes straight through. While this is an axle hole, so it does go straight through. So it's a little off kilter, but it's pretty easy to manage. And as you can tell, if you tried to guess before I pulled these off which one was which, it's not possible. So um, in my opinion, you can definitely use the cheaper version. The most expensive single element is the windscreen 16 by 8 by 6 curved with three pinholes and trans clear, part 16477. This is one of the best windscreens LEGO has ever done in my opinion, and the trans clear color was exclusive to the UCS Slave 1 set 75060. So if you have that set and don't mind plundering it, then that will save you a ton of money. The downside of the plain trans clear version is that it won't look quite as nice due to the missing stickers on either side. So if you buy part 16477, you don't get these stickers here. It's obviously more looks more like this, except in trans clear without the, the nice curve there. This is pretty easy to replicate with like gray electrical tape, and I think that's what actually the designers recommend. So it might cost you an extra $5 to get some electrical tape at Home Depot or something. You may have luck finding the UCS variant of the windscreen that I have here, and that's part 16477PB01. And of course, like I said, the only difference is that you get the stickers. But this also tends to be extremely expensive and very rare, at well over $150 US dollars if you can find one. Like I said earlier, the designers have included a very helpful suggestion, which is to buy the trans purple variant of the windscreen and spray paint it on the inside. So that's what I did here. And the process is fairly simple. It does require you to buy a $10 can of model spray paint as well. I did spend another $10 for a replica sticker sheet to get the uh, gray stickers on the side. I just haven't put them on yet. Um, I actually kind of screwed up the painting here, so I didn't put it on. I'll throw up a picture when I do that. Um, and like I said, gray electrical tape, and there are uh, stickers included in the instructions that you can print out on a color printer if you have one. Sadly, the four Technic Panel Car Mudguard Arched number 30, 9x2x3, straight top in light bluish gray, Part 42531 has basically vanished from BrickLink in any appreciable quantity. I think it would be really great for someone to come up with a brick-built alternative for the next revision, uh, as right now it's incredibly difficult to source these. I got really lucky and I found four of them from a US seller for uh, a then reasonable price. I bought these pretty early because I knew these were going to be expensive. But as you can see, they are pretty prominent in the build. There's, these two are the most visible. And there are two stuck behind here, which you could probably leave out if you really wanted to. But in my opinion, there's really no substitute for these, unless someone much more talented than I is willing to come up with a brick-built equivalent. The two-plate round 1x1 one one with flower edge for pedals part 33291 in light bluish gray are, I believe, representing uh, the missiles inside the missile compartment, if that's what this actually is. These can be omitted or substituted with the round plate 1x1 one one with hollow studs part 85861 in light bluish gray. And that would bring the quantity of 85861 from 6 to 8. The two cone 2x2 two two truncated with four black squares pattern part 98100 PB13 in light bluish gray are used for the sonic charges. The plain version of this cone works just fine in my opinion, part 98100 in light bluish gray, which is very common. 
The two Technic Gear Timing Wheel 8 Tooth in Light Bluish Gray is very expensive, part 32060. I recommend substituting the older Light Gray for this piece, but even the supply of those has become very scarce in the United States, which is super unfortunate for other models like Brick Vault's Mandalorian N1. Thankfully this is not used as a timing wheel, and more for texture, and these are right here on the wing support struts. So I looked for an element with the same dimensions that was circular and less expensive. So here I have some timing wheels on the top and the replacements I found here. The closest match I found was the string reel 2x2x1 two by two by drum with axle hole part 61510 or two Technic Gear 12 tooth bevel part 6589. So the string drum is on the left here and the two smaller gears on the right. These are the same width as the timing gear and approximately the same diameter. The main thing is that the diameter can't be larger than the timing wheel so many of the Technic Gears won't work. Cost-wise, these are pretty similar, but the string reels are cheaper, just because they're less desirable and you only need to buy two total instead of four. The panel 1x4x1 in sand green, part 30413, is very expensive these days as well, and unfortunately not available from Pick-A-Brick. Tragically, none of the other size panels, like 1x2, 1x3, come in sand green either, so if you can't get four of them for a good price, I suggest swapping them out for the 1x4x1 panel in light bluish gray. These panels are located to either side of the cockpit, right here, as well as on the nose section of the ship. There's one right here and one on the other side. If you swap these out for light bluish gray, that brings your total of the light bluish gray 1x4x1 panels from 11 to 15. A significant portion of the elements in the early steps are hidden in the final build as they form the structural outline that makes the basic shape and it provides the frame for the subassemblies to attach later on. The following elements can therefore be any color in my opinion. The 23 Technic Pin 1 half without friction ridges part 4274 are specified in light bluish gray. I wasn't able to find any instances where these are visible so the more common blue should be just fine. Same story with the 4 Technic Pin 3L with friction ridges part 6558 specified in black. The more common blue will work just fine as these are all hidden inside the internal frame. The stand parts list has a number of pieces listed in the standard red color indicating that they are hidden. And this didn't seem like a complete accounting, so you can substitute any color for the following elements. Finally, you might consider buying the following elements directly from LEGO's pick -a brick service. pick -a brick orders over $35 total qualify for free shipping, and if you spend more than $14 in the bestseller and standard categories, all of the handling fees are waived. The following elements are typically more expensive on BrickLink than directly from LEGO. And finally, you'll maximize your savings using the Brick Hunter extension to check the entire parts list against the Pick a Brick inventory. Check out my video on Brick Hunter if you haven't already or don't know how to use it. The only thing that's complicated about this model since there are so many elements is that there is a limit of 150 bestseller elements or 150 standard elements. You can have up to 300 if you get 150 and 150. So you do have to split up the wanted list a little bit to place multiple orders from Pick a Brick. The Slave 1 consists of 878 numbered steps, with each part or subassembly you have in each step outlined in red against a tan background. The model instructions also include the display stand, which makes perfect sense to me, as the stand is mandatory for this model in my opinion. Not all the steps are numbered sequentially, sometimes the subassemblies are too large to be shown in one little display box for a numbered step, so they start at 1, and I think for ease of reference it would be a lot better to have those subassembly steps sequenced with the overall build. The stand is a good example of this, after step 826 the numbering starts over at 1 for the stand, the stand takes up the next 83 steps, after which the build continues at step 827. But for a model with this many pieces and steps, the instructions are excellent. They are in a noticeably lower resolution than most instructions I'm useful, and I assume this is to keep the instructions file size manageable, and it's about 84 megabytes if I recall. It only occasionally affects the build experience, and as some visual noise can be seen in certain steps. And in steps 139, the one, two 1x1 tiles kind of look like a 1x2 tile to me. Occasionally, the build does require you to make connections on more than one side of a piece, such as in steps 281 and step 9 of the side paneling. There are a few minor viewing angle problems, for example in step 136, the second brick 1x1 one one with axle hole is obscured by the lift arm, but there aren't any instances in which this wasn't fairly obvious where the hidden piece goes. 
Another example is in step 741 and 754. A picture or a note showing where exactly the droid arm should clip on would be really nice, as the subassembly hides the connection point in the instructions. I noticed a few small sequencing errors. In step 79, the two 1x1 black tiles are hard to get in place because of the 1x3 inverted tiles you added in step 68. In step 9 of the underside of the nose, uh, this is what I'm talking about when I wish the steps were numbered sequentially, but it's on page 308 of the instructions. You can't get the bracket in place without first removing the grill tile that you installed in the previous step. I also could have used a note on the Technic axles indicating their length. Trial and error isn't much fun on a model like this, and it would be nice to know immediately if the axle in step 186 is 10L or 12L. Spoiler alert, it's, it's 10L. The way it's shown in the step may lead you to believe it's a 12L axle mirrored on both sides, but it's not until several pages later you find out that you push this axle through after building the cockpit subassembly. The subassemblies that connect in steps 760 and 768 were very difficult for me to get in place. The tolerances are incredibly tight and the subassembly can move in a lot of different ways, so it just takes a while to get in place. I recommend putting an extra 1x2 plate underneath the plate modified 1x2 with toe ball as shown here in the picture to give the assembly some contact with the parts underneath, allowing you to apply some additional pressure. Finally, the wing brackets are missing the X2 multiplier on page 1047. I have no idea how long it took me to build this model, but certainly in excess of 20 hours and probably longer. The vast majority of the model, probably 95% or so, is doable for intermediate level builders that have built the larger official sets with Technic frames. That last 5% though can test the patience of even very experienced builders, so I recommend taking a deep breath if you have a tough section and be willing to walk away and take a break. I also recommend building the stand early on and mounting the ship on it as soon as you can, possibly as early as step 347. This greatly reduces the footprint of the model on your desk and should offer a stable platform to attach most of the subassemblies. This model should primarily be set on display, but I was pleasantly surprised at how durable it is. Multiple times throughout the build you have to turn it over and prop it up at weird angles depending on what you're doing, and there was never a time when I thought the model was going to just explode or anything like that. The instructions also have a section dedicated to lifting it off a table, and it shows you how to do that, and also putting it on the display stand, which I think is a really great inclusion. I almost had a heart attack when I first mounted this on the stand. Um, when I put this on the stand, I did it after most of the model was constructed, and um, I did not know that it went the, the post that this sits on went in further than I thought it did. And so I put it on, it wasn't in all the way, and then a couple minutes later it like settled with a big thud, and that was really scary. But nothing, you know, everything held together, so it worked out okay. Um, it was just an experience. I don't find the ship very swishable for lack of a great place to hold it, and two hands are required at all times unless you're much braver than I. Being over 5,000 pieces for the ship and stand, the weight of all the plastic is a significant deterrent to swooshing it around as well. Off the stand, there's really only one way you'd be able to pose the ship, and that's in the landing position. Lifting it up is a little nerve-wracking, but it's not too bad. And again, it's very impressive that the build this complex is also quite solid. So overall, while this model can be handled, I honestly don't think you're going to want to. You get a feel for the parts of the build that you never want to mess with again during construction, and when considering how good this looks on the stand, the bulk of the model, and the potential for an accident, most people will be just fine leaving it alone on their shelf. Space Plastic and Marshall Bonema's UCCS Slave 1 model deserves pretty much every bit of praise you've heard in the year or so since it came out. The Slave 1 is one of the most unique shapes for a ship in science fiction, and one that doesn't lend itself to easy recreation in the LEGO system at all. Yet here it is, and it is an amazing model to have in your collection. If you're watching this video, you know that this is going to be an expensive one to build. There's really no way around it. There's no secret that I know of to get over 5,000 pieces on the cheap. Like I said in the introduction, the vanilla parts list ran me 9 stores and $1,001 without shipping in tax for the ship and stand, or about $1,152 with shipping in tax, and that's using $9 for a shipping and handling per store on BrickLink. With all of my substitutions, but still not using Pick a Brick, my results improved to 8 stores and $670 without shipping in tax, or about $789 with shipping in tax.
with my substitutions and the list of elements I recommend buying from Pick a Brick. My Pick a Brick total was $94, and that includes uh, tax, but did not include any shipping and handling charges because I met the minimums. Buying the rest from Bricklink, I got 7 stores and $569 without shipping and tax, or about $665 with shipping and tax, for a total of $759. Finally, buying as much as I could from Pick a Brick, I had to split my wanted list into multiple Brick Hunter wanted lists to ensure I stay below the 150 element limit. My Pick a Brick total was $539, and each of the orders did meet the minimums for free shipping and handling, though of course taxes included. I only had to buy 44 elements from Bricklink, and I got those. I would get those from 5 stores and $129 without shipping and tax or about $168 with shipping and tax, and I did drop the shipping and handling estimate down to $6 like I normally do, for a total of $707 or $445 less than what I started with only using Bricklink. I don't know about you, but I was pretty happy to be able to knock just over 38% off of the Bricklink only price. As always, there may be some additional efficiencies you can gain by purchasing some of the more common elements like small plates used off of Bricklink, so it's very possible you could get the total under $700. Instructions for the UCCS Slave 1 cost $59.99, and they are available from BrickVault's web store. There will be a link to where you can buy those in the description below. And remember, you can use the discount code CATS15 for 15% off if you haven't already used it. There's also a Django Fett variant available for the same price, or you can buy both color schemes for $89.99. Thanks as always for watching my review of the UCCS Slave 1 designed by Space Plastic and Marshall Banana. If you built this model you have something to share that I left out, or have a question about something I didn't cover, please leave your thoughts below in the comments. Remember to subscribe, leave the video a like, and follow me on Instagram if you haven't already. Each subscription and like helps increase the channel's visibility, and I greatly appreciate your support. I hope to see you back next time. Thank you.